thank you both so much for joining me for this little chat about what it's like to be a musician. Um, can, can you start off by just introducing yourselves to everybody? Hello, my name is Derry Joseph Lewis. I am a composer and I am currently in my fourth year at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama and I'm this close to graduating. And I'm uh, Jasper Domit. I am also a composer at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. Um, I'm in my third year and I am this close <laughs> from uh, graduating. <laughs> um, yeah. So what I, I'm always interested, what actually drew you both to composing? Because it's some, for me, it's something as a performer, I never felt really comfortable when I had to compose, I, I'm fine playing somebody else's dots, but I've never felt like I have that inside me to, that notes are kind of wanting to come out. <laughs> well, I think the opposite happened to me. I didn't like playing other people's notes when I was in school. Um, I, when I was going through GCSE and A-level music, I was playing the piano as my instrument. And the thing I liked the least was sitting down and practicing and going through stuff slowly and doing scales. And I just, much prefer to sit down and sort of let my ideas run free and sort of improvise at the piano and people would listen in like in the school hall where the piano was and they'd hear oh you Derry's in there because this is a piece we've never heard before <laughs> and they sort of you know they said can you play this in assembly the next time that you're there and so it, it then like just became a medium of that's how I expressed myself rather than sitting down and learning Bach or Mozart or whatever my teacher was like trying to shove at me. <laughs> Instead, it was what have you composed this week and how can that help your technique? That's fantastic. And I think for for me actually, it's it came from performance. So I started learning piano when I was about eleven, and then I started learning cornet for my local brass bands, and then I became in the banding tradition. And I, I know specifically. The moment I kind of said I wanted to start writing was um, in, in the world of brass banding. We we do a lot of uh, rehearsal for competitions, and you know um, you go and play for your area, and then you go to the nationals, etc. And there was this one competition, and the test piece was by a composer called Derek Bourgeois. The the piece was called uh, Devil in the Deep Blue Sea. And I remember it was the first time I'd ever heard this piece and I was just there like, oh my God, I never heard a piece like this. And ironically, the band which played it and I listened to is now the band I'm playing for. <laughs> so it's kind of this whole circle moment. But I, yeah, in that moment, I just knew that was kind of what I wanted to do and, and I wanted to write. But when I applied uh, to music college, I actually had uh, places on both performance and composition and it, that was such a hard choice because obviously I'd grown up playing and that was kind of my way into music and the writing was kind of my hobby as it were. I don't, I don't know how to explain that but so I, I did choose to do my degree in performance um, on the baritone horn um, at the Royal Welsh College and I just realised over the year that it wasn't something which I kind of could give my all at and was something which I didn't feel I was going to have a enjoyable career out of and actually the composition probably was the better path so um, luckily the college agreed for me to switch courses onto composition which I am you know really enjoying and actually it's kind of brought back all of my enjoyment of playing because there's not that pressure of you know practicing for four or five hours a day you know I still obviously have to practice every day but it's kind of less pressure um with um being able to compose as like the forefront of my my um career i suppose so that's yeah amazing. that's my story amazing <laughs> to hear that journey actually so did you did you both have um were you in schools that had a lot of music or or did you have musical families well i i, I no one in my family plays so I was the only musician. The, the only musician before me was my, my great granddad, who was a euphonium player. And, you know, he was, he was amazing. And um, so I, I, I knew that lineage, but that was, that was it. So I had no support. And unfortunately with um, the decline in funding for music education, by the time I came to do my A-level, I was in a position where 
I was the only student in my A-level class and there was an unfortunate situation where um, they were unable to access a teacher who was qualified to teach A-level music um, for my um, AS at least. Um, luckily I had an A2 teacher so for that whole period I was having to teach myself effectively to get through my A-level but in a way I felt even more determined to do well um, just because of that adversity. <laughs> Stupidly back then I wanted to be a pharmacist so I was actually <laughs> training for something else um, and then I failed maths, chemistry and biology so that wasn't that was not my route. <laughs> um, but then I did really well in music but you know I, I must admit the the education whilst the teachers are, are, are really supportive they are up against so much adversity with the decline in funding and it, it, it's such a massive shame um, because I just think to myself if I had the extra support when I was younger you know how different things would be now um, but in a way I don't know if I would change change that because I think that also has molded how my perception of music and just my general journey as well I don't know mm. about you I think our story is sort of kind of similar in terms of music education. Um, when I was in uh, in A-level, there was three of us in the first year, and then by the second year, it was just me. So it was sort of the worst school orchestra you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had two people on cornets and myself on violin. And you've heard him play violin, so. <laughs> well, to be fair, I've only ever heard you play violin when there was a masterpiece of tin foil on it. And I <laughs> probably made it sound better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In terms of like musical families though, um, it's interesting you were talking about your grandfather, great grandfather. Great -grandfather yeah. My twice great grandfather's parents, so three times great grandparents, <laughs> they were massive classical music fans and they named my twice great grandpa and his brother Mendelssohn and Amadeus. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then none of that passed down. So my parents both really like folk and sort of like rock, like my dad loves the Scorpions um, and Queen um, and all of that stuff was very like loud on the speakers when I was growing up. So for me to say, I like listening to classical music and that's what I'm going to compose, I think was a little bit of a shock to them. <laughs> but then, you know, to have had or to have all of those different sound worlds mm. in your head, it's, I don't think that's any bad thing. I mean, I was the exact opposite that my dad really loved classical music and kind of wouldn't let me listen to anything else and <laughs> my rebellion was was listening to really loud rock music <laughs> um which he really didn't like but there we go yeah amazing do you, do you feel so i know you're asking the questions but do, do you feel <laughs> that by listening to rock that shaped how you play violin in a certain way definitely when i as i started exploring more and more different music um, it definitely, especially later on, once I got out of the music education system, um, I I really started exploring what I was listening to, and definitely the different sounds that I was hearing, it was something that began to affect the sounds I was creating on a violin. Because mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, okay, I don't play bass guitar, but I want to sound like that as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the best things about the time that we're living in is that everyone has so many different sort of influences coming in, like even going back 50 years ago when Berio was writing his Sinfonia, he only included quotes that he had like in his local library. Yeah. So he had this limited access to these different musics that he wanted to put in. Whereas we have like the whole of Spotify, mm. all of Apple Music, plus whatever we were taught in school mm. yeah. or that we rebelled and listened to <laughs> instead. Basically. Definitely. And then, you know, all of that comes more and more into, you know, if you, if you are living a world where you do lots of new music, like I am, um, you, you do find that there's so much of that comes into whatever you're playing that, you know, it, composers don't just sit in their little glass boxes where they're only listening to Mozart and that's all of mm. the sound world that they have in their head. So, you know, the, the more music you, I suppose, uh, the more sounds that that you've heard you mm. know the more you've got to 
to draw into what you then create. Um, and you see that all the way like throughout art whenever someone tries to like apply a, an ism to something the artist or the composer or whoever always says no just because that's a, like a similar theme throughout what I'm doing that's not what I'm thinking like mm. Debussy said no it's not impressionism and and John Adams and all that crew have said no it's not minimalism yeah. that even though people like to put everything in a bubble for academic purposes I think it's impossible to ignore stuff like that. Any any artist of any kind, whatever side of art it is, I don't think anybody wants to be put in a box. I mean, I think no, no. there's anything that's why we do it, because we don't want to be hemmed in and boxed in. And it, it's so interesting reading through some um, application forms for schemes and things. Quite often this, a question is, is kind of, you know, what, what do you class for music or n not so much that it's like, you know, how would you describe your own music? And actually, I, I, I sit there and think, well, how, how can I describe my own music? It's kind of firstly something which comes from like out of me. And it, it, it's such a hard thing to put into words. And yeah, for anyone to be put into a box, you know, uh, when I was in, I don't know, what my second year, I, I people used to say, oh, your, your music's accessible because it kind of has a way of speaking to an audience and I was thinking well that's not what I'm trying to achieve you know I don't want to be classed as 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 that um so yeah no I really understand that kind of comments on not wanting to be kind of boxed in because you know as we develop as as any artist we we change our view on 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 our arts and what we want to say and you know we we can say something in so many different ways it's just kind of saying it how you would say it because at the end of the day you're the only person who can can express that in in that way if that makes and, sense and how you would be saying it at that specific moment in time yeah yeah definitely i always find that the like the biggest oh sorry but no, say that again as you said no that's that's one of those things it's always going to be changing yeah 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 you hope and uh, yeah Taking oh no i've got more <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, that's so that's really super interesting. Um, I think, just talking to composers a lot, because I do that, because I find them extremely interesting. Um, I just <laughs> find it really interesting. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> how different people's work ethic is, or how, how they go about writing something. Um, and, just, yeah, where, where do you both take inspiration from? I mean, I know, Jess, we've, we've, you've got um a piece that i was just recording remotely for yeah. inspired by mark rothko um yes. one of my favorite you know the rothko room in well yeah that, well, one of my favorite places in london i spent hours and, sitting in there so well that and I, I don't know how much you read of the program note but that piece you recorded is about that room yeah. and w was designed for that room That's, it's such an interesting question about inspiration and it's something i've changed especially this significantly sorry i can't speak um <laughs> especially this year um i had quite a, a traumatic start to my year with a quite a personal loss um with my um my nan passing away and often when i when i write especially it, it it comes from very deep and it's like a very emotionally attached and at that time i just found myself at such a like i just couldn't write anything it was almost like i my whole world had kind of been decimated and it was just bizarre because like normally i'm able to channel what i'm feeling into into a piece of music and i think it it what the the effect of it it kind of made me just feel uninspired with all art and and um how i, I looked at music and i was reading a, a book by jonathan harvey the composer um on music and uh, inspiration and he said um inspiration is often formed by many types of preparation which i found really quite interesting i, I thought oh you know, when I normally write a piece of music, I'll sit down and go, okay, this piece is going to be about this. Here's the chords, here's the hexachordal rotation, all of, all of that crap. And, <laughs> and I then at the very last minute, I'll go, oh, oh my God, um, how does this fit the concept? Oh, I'll just write something to kind of make it fit the concept. 
but I never really started with concepts and really thought of that. So reading that quote by Harvey has made me realise that my pieces need to have something more conceptually for me to be able to really home in on my emotional response and then it needs to be something extra um, about it so that's kind of my standpoint I, I, I now spend I don't know a few months or sorry I, am, I know I'm waffling I'm sorry um, <laughs> interesting <laughs> <laughs> I, I spend a lot more time basically now preparing in terms of um, developing a concept, thinking about sounds, thinking about all of that before I'll even kind of start writing a note. Um, that, so the, the piece you wrote effectively took me a whole year to write and it's not finished yet. I don't feel um, there's still more to go with that piece, um, but I just haven't found the sounds I want. But instead of what I would have done a couple of years ago and just kind of knocked anything together and gone, oh, that will do, kind of, that's kind of what I do. I've become a lot more focused now on kind of really trying to realise the concept, you know, and specifically with that piece, the Mark Rothko piece, he, there was a lovely quote, he said, he said, um, a painting is not of an ex experience, but is the experience itself, which I find really interesting. And I feel that's what music should be. You know, music can depict something, but until music is the experience of something, it's kind of, I think, felt sh full short of it. So that's kind of where I'm at, really, is kind of really being quite um, relevant to the concept and trying to realise that as best as I can. I think that people say often about poetry that the, the bit that makes it poetry is the bit that can't be translated in a different language. I think like what Jasper's talking about with music is the same thing. Like the music that you're talking about is the thing that can't be expressed in words and that's why you have to express it in music. Mm, definitely, yeah. I mean, I suppose that, that comes to performing as well. You know, yeah. once we've got those notes. And, you know, that's, that's our joy is to be able to bring them to life and, and give people that experience. Yeah. And I... Otherwise, guess if they were looking at a piece of paper. And I, I, I know you as performers probably experience it from this side, but I, I, don't, I don't know if you quite realise how much just hearing a, a player play your music, it, it's just such like life changing in a way. Well, yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's so weird. You, you, you sit in front of your, your, your laptop or, your, or the piano, whatever, however you write in your head, and you kind of imagine this sound world or you become used to how you hear it in your head. And then the first time you hear a player play it, it's like, oh my God, it, 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 it just changes completely. And yes, it can be in a, in a bad way. You can go, oh my God, that's not what I wanted, Christ, or I need to change it. Or it can be, you know, in a completely different way. I, I, I wrote a piece this year for, BBC National Orchestra of Wales, which has a, a long a melody, which was based on um, how me and my grandmother used to whistle to each other so we could, it was like a Marco Polo thing, you know, to find each other around the house. And um, Sarah Jane, who's the Cor Anglais player, the first time she played it, I, I, I started to cry because it was just so emotionally impactful to actually hear it played by a live person. Because it is like bringing it to life yeah. when someone plays your music all of a sudden this thing that like only exists in dots and lines and squiggles on the page is like like brought to life and that's I think the thing at the moment yeah. that I'm missing the most is hearing people play music yeah. live definitely there's this like this connection like an electricity you get if you're in a concert hall or an opera house or in a theatre we write music <laughs> in the exact opposite way where Jasper's talking about like um an emotional concept I think I try and do the opposite I, um I think I'm never really worried about how I feel that like the emotion that I'm feeling is always sort of separate to the music. There's always some sort of different concept or it's, it's more to do with text. I think um, the way that Jasper's talking about the Rothko piece, he's always thinking about like the color and the structure, mm. whereas I'm sort of more thinking about like the, the shape of a text or the sound or the sort of the feel underneath that. Mm. And I always think, uh, Jasper always says that like, how have you done that when you're not thinking about this specific place or this specific time and I think it's so cool that we can write music 
that is like approaching inspiration from from mm. both ends of the spectrum. And I, I hope you don't mind me saying, but the the piece you've just produced, Trio, mm -hmm. when you started writing on that piece, you tried to actually access the piece from how I would access, or not not from, but you 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 tried to ex experiment something very different, and soon realised that that's not how you write, but that is okay. Yeah, I was in a massive rut for almost a year basically trying to write a piece that was the big piece of my graduation and I just didn't write anything for six months because I was trying to access this part of my brain that doesn't really exist thinking about the emotion and the sort of the story behind what was going on and then um, I was studying in Switzerland and I didn't write anything for those three months that I was there when I got back my tutor sat me down and said this is not how you write you need to think of something else and do it how you've always done it mm. and I wrote the piece like I sat down and just didn't stop writing basically for a couple of weeks and that's this this piece that Jasper's talking about amazing I and mean, I guess at the end of the day you you just have to accept that everybody 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 works in different ways yeah and, you know if you it's always good to explore other op options but at the end of the day to know that what works for one person isn't going to work for the next mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. But it must be so, so interesting to explore all that. Yeah, and I think that's a good, you know, people often say, oh, I don't understand why you go to university to study writing, you know, you, you could just learn that in your own time. But actually, it gives you the opportunity to spend four years or however long just focused on trying things out. You know, one of our tutors, Mark, Mark um, David Bowden, um, he he brings pieces of music for us to listen and analyse, and he always says, and like just remember, like you're not listening to these pieces because to to copy their sound or to kind or to of like it, or even. yeah, or to like it, it's just listening to kind of how they've done it and how you would interpret that in your own writing, and I think that is that is essentially what we do, you know, as as we grow as especially in this part of our development isn't yeah because in university or oh, any sort of like period where you can just write music it's like a safety blanket there's no fear of going wrong you can write in a different style like I tried to do and it doesn't matter that it didn't work because we have this like support network around us of, of teachers and of our colleagues other composers and performers and the fact that you know you're not going to be in a situation again with that sort of ease of being surrounded by performers who you can try to mm. bet on. Yeah, that's no, true. Once you're in the, yeah, the wide world, it's going to be much harder to just to, to experiment. Mm. On it's scary. <laughs> no, but also very exciting. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, you're always going to have people out there who, who are going to be, you know, I'm always super happy when people get in touch and say oh how do you do this or how would this sound and you know it's always it's always great because it means that I can procrastinate from practicing which I'd <laughs> otherwise probably be doing and sit down and do a little video of what it sounds like and it makes yeah. me feel good <laughs> <laughs> now you've said that online everyone's going to send you loads of stuff <laughs> like <laughs> how do you do this <laughs> <laughs> but no I mean it's it's just it's great to be able to support people like that actually you know what whatever point they're at um in their in their journey as composers it's because you know it's just great to also for me to get scores that are imaginative and that know how to use my instrument and i can't expect that every composer is going to know how to write the violin you know it's, no we don't <laughs> I'm <afraid of> <laughs> perfectly well did i um, just just going back to the inspiration thing so when you if you were doing something instrumental compared to something, say film music compared to say an opera, mm -hmm. would you come at them from very different angles or would you still come to it from basically that place that you work from? I think you have to with an opera, for example, or if it, even if it's a song, anything that's like setting text to music, you're not just a composer, you're then a dramaturg. Mm -hmm. You have to think about it's not like um, if you're directing a Shakespeare play, you have so many different options of how you can set the narrative and like, like to put it like very simply, like is this character an angry character or are they like a shy character? You can 
interpret the words in so many ways and if you're composing an opera you only have one sort of way of expressing that information if you're then directing an opera it's about trying to find that tiny little gap between is it slightly angry or is it even angrier and you, you have this like fine balance that as a composer you really have to nail it and i think specifically with opera for me because I, i'm starting a new opera um, now for for my end of year next year i've i've had this text since i was about oh, i don't know 16 and um back then I, I studied it for my drama a level and it was only until i came to music college doing composition i was like you know what i think that storyline has all of the kind of things which sum up an opera, you know, there's a love story, there's this story, there's this story, but then it also, in the opera, uh, the, the play itself, um, the play is Coram Boy, for yeah. anyone who wants to read the book, the, the play. Um, it's got a connection with Handel's music anyway. So it's already got this connection. And for me, I, I was just reading it and I've never really, or I don't often read texts and feel inspired. And I think that's just because of my dyslexia that I, I find that I'm not able to kind of respond to text as, uh, as well as I'm able to respond to painting, etc. But there's something about this specific play and how it's, how it's written that I just kind of resonated. And for me, I'm, I tend not to write a piece which has a narrative or is trying to tell a story not because I don't want to or anything like that, it's just not how I write, but for this play and speaking with my, my director and how we're gonna go about it, I said to her, the storyline is the main thing about this play mm -hmm. and that is what, it, what makes a play. So it's gonna be interesting. It, I, I feel it might have a similar situation with what you did that I'm gonna have, I'll approach it from a different way and it might not work out as, as well as I want, but I'm really conscious to approach it in a way that I'm able to um, to express the the narrative, the storyline in its best light, effectively. Um, so yeah, you do film music. Though. Yeah, there's an interesting parallel between what film music is trying to do and what opera is trying to do, and that is it's it's telling a story through the music alone. Like it, you shouldn't ever be relying on the text on the libretto of the opera. Mm. Your job is to channel everything that's going on in that text in the music. And in film music, that's all you have to do. You have the, the script and you have the director's vision and then you have to respond to what's happening on screen. And everything that you do has to be so sort of focused on telling this exact story that's going on and suggesting things that are going on, like subtext within the character's mind. Um, directors have given me notes that are like, oh, we need to make sure the audience is aware that he's noticed that object. And how do you translate that in music? It's such a hard thing to do. Mm. Um, and especially and imagine without like ending up using cliches as well. Exactly. Yeah, you have to invent and reinvent the like the way that I'm working to make sure that I'm not compromising my like own integrity. And that's one of the huge things yeah. that I think people trip up on when they're trying to write music for film or for TV or any sort of um, so and anything with the lineage. I feel. Like if if there's a certain sound world which you is is not inherent, but like when you listen to a film, you you know kind of what the the music's going to sound like in in a way. Mm. It's almost like when people approach writing film, they they kind of forget their own compositional voice, and that also happens in classical music. Um, my teacher was saying to me that often when people approach writing for a string quartet. Yeah. They they completely forget their own voice and they mm. they go right every string quartet's got this so I must sound like this or I've got to do this I've got to do this and there was a Lawrence Osborne recently had a, a premiere for Mahana Spahani and uh, Brilliant Symphonia and I went along to the pre concert a talk and he was saying exactly that about writing for the harpsichord that this amazing yeah. thing that there isn't this whole you know you, you go to a piano piece and you know, all of that history of piano music, you can't help but, you know, have that yeah. there in your, in, in your mind. Um, mm -hmm. Not that you'd be nicking stuff off it, but that it's just there, it's history, it's, it's, it's surrounding you. Whereas with the harpsichord, you don't have that in that same yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. So 
I, I can totally see that any sort of musical, you know, writing for, for something that's, whether it's film, you know, it, like you say, that just has that history of sound that, you know, starting really, I guess, Corn Gold's creating that sound mm. world that became what film music was. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Off on one. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's a, a, a credible point to make. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, what I was saying as well about um, opera and film, I think that the like the crucial difference is that film music rarely ever, like now in contemporary film, gets that chance to take focus for a second. If you're watching Star Wars or like even earlier, the stuff that Korngold was doing, there are these moments where the, the score like pulls focus for a second and you sort of don't care what's happening on screen because your ears are sort of pulling focus mm. but in in modern film that's sort of not the case and not the expectation that what you're writing is the main focus it's just sort of like tumbling away in the background mm. definitely yeah you think you think back to like the stanley kubrick 2001 space odyssey that music was so perfectly selected in a way mm. it does exactly what you say it takes it takes you away from from like what's going on and you just invent like this whole world you know when you've seen the monolith for the first time and you're you're hearing what is playing at that time it's uh, uh ligeti the, the 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 um atmospheres is it atmospheres or is it the it's requiem, requiem or something requiem, yeah. i think it's the requiem. yeah but it takes it it takes your mind to this completely different world and I just find that that story so interesting that they actually had a composer for that that film who didn't know that his music wasn't going to be played until he sat down and watched the premiere and heard all of this like um, other music and he was like, "What? What the hell? Like this isn't this is not my score." And um, you know, it I was completely re yeah yeah yeah. I've never seen the film, which um, I now feel like we should go and watch it. Um, <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, I think it's one of those films you have to watch every like 10 years. You have to catch up because it means something different because the meaning is so abstract. And the, okay. the music is like really confusing because it's this film obviously set then in the future. Mm. There are Strauss waltzes going on mm. in the background and then we have Ligeti and there's this, this really cool sort of referencing back and forward that, that goes on that I think it's a really good example of music actually that can pull the focus yeah. and bring the story and along. It's so well selected. Like I, I feel a lot of film scores are written specifically to underscore from start to finish without without time to give the the action on screen time to breathe without in just silence. And specifically that film, there is there is a lot of silence, mm -hmm. you know, between when the, the music comes in and when it comes in, you know it's like oh my god there's music something either must be happening or or there's something and i think i think people don't like write like that now it's it it must be really hard to be a film composer because there is an expectation of that you kind of i'm, I'm gonna say it you kind of have to write derivative oh i'm not gonna say it <laughs> <laughs> derivative. derivative music to sell seats to sell tickets and Something which we often speak about at college when composers come in to talk about film is you as a film composer have to know so much more than just us people who write for the concert hall because you don't know what's going to be on that temp track and you don't know what the director is going to want from you. Mm. A director could give you, I don't know, um, Penderecki or, Tango. or anything and say, this is what I want or this is the sound world I want and you're you're kind of expected to kind of know how to write like that or or go completely the other direction whereas as, as a concert writer we write the music we want to write which which is our own comp compositional voice so in a way it's a bit easier but harder monetary wise. <laughs> do, you, do you ever find that Fenella? The, what? If, if you're programming one of your concerts do you ever find that you're towing the line between selling seats because you've got oh, a big name absolutely. and not just that I'm doing that but you know I'll I'll quite often have a promoter saying to me um they'll they'll ask for programs that I'd like to do and I'll send them a couple of a couple of programs through um and 
they'll pretty much say, well, oh, you, you know, we, we don't want any of this contemporary music. Quite often, going back to early 20th century, to them, a lot mm -hmm. of the time will be seen as, some, for them, something that they feel is going to put audience off coming to the concert. Really? So I'll trade off something that is new that I want to play because I feel it's really important to give people that breadth of music. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll trade off, like, I'll offer Spring Sonata in exchange for being allowed to program something new mm -hmm. or something by a composer that the audience won't have heard of. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it usually works. And, it, you know, 99% of the time, I will have somebody come up to me at the end of a concert and say, I didn't think I was going to enjoy that piece by <laughs> yeah. a contemporary composer, but it was brilliant and I'm going to go and listen <laughs> some more. And I just think, like, I wish that always that the promoters could hear those reactions. Yeah. yeah and definitely. trust that, you know, if, if they're going to have you coming in to do a concert, that they trust that you're, I know that they have to t sell tickets and I understand why it's important to have, you know, a, a program that's going to bring in their core audience, obviously, and not put people off. But at the same time, you know, to, to give trust to the performers that if they believe a piece of music is great, that you're going to be able to convince the audience that it's also great. And, mm. you know, it's, it's always difficult. It's, it's difficult to balance that thing between you know, keeping keeping the promoter on side and um, also being true to what you believe is right. Because if we're not playing new music, nobody in twenty years will be listening to new, new music. No. It won't no, it's, be, it's, be writing it because there are no performances. So, yeah, <laughs> it's it is it's a tough balance, isn't it? You know, and and I can completely empathise. Well, not empathise, sympathise for you to have to actually think of because also you then I don't know how you go about writing your programs but I, I guess you kind of have to think of like a, a train or a thread which kind of runs through it you know I wouldn't you know I I ideally will go about a program thinking you know obviously people will have specific desires for a program, you know, whether it's the promoter or whether it's another performer that I'm working with, whatever it happens to be, and trying to find a way of doing what they want, but also something that, like you say, has a thread running through, has some something where you can look at it. It doesn't even need to be a theme. It doesn't need to be, oh yeah, well they're all Austrian or they were all born in 1933. Well, it doesn't need to be something like that, but it's something where you can feel that those pieces of music run through as an arch of a program, not just as six different pieces. Mm -hmm. So that people come away feeling like they've had an overarching experience that's taken mm -hmm. different places, but in a way that makes sense. Um, and you know, all sorts of different things can have that effect, but it's it's finding finding a way of doing that. And you know, there sometimes it's a key thing as well that, you know, certain keys next to each other sound a bit wrong, but then other other ones sound really great so yeah i mean it's, it's all sorts of all sorts of things go into that obviously coronavirus has hit us all a lot um in the music industry and i just how how much has it affected you because i know for a lot of composers it's actually not made so much of a difference well i think the the idea knowing that everything has sort of come to a halt it sort of tipped the momentum off for me I, I normally am good at getting up and doing a couple of hours of composing in the morning. That's my routine. And then I'll do everything else in the afternoon. But I just find that for this strange reason, I don't really want to compose for that often. Sometimes I'll, I'll look at what I've done the previous day and think, actually, no, like mm. I'm just not in the right mind frame. And I think that's the main thing for me that this situation, whether it's just being stuck in the same four walls every day or, or whether it's just the idea that knowing that we there's this sort of like indeterminate kind of state going on in, in music at the moment. I think that's the main thing for me that coronavirus has done is it's just sort of kicked the um the like the ball has stopped rolling, I think, mm. for, for my composition at the moment. Yeah, and yeah, there's two things I think specifically for us, um we our our college went into lockdown a week before 
the end of term one. Mm-hmm. So it meant any recordings we had scheduled for our portfolios and all of that kind of got cancelled. So it meant that we had written all this music, which, you know, could, could have taken a few, quite a few months or, or the whole year for some of the graduating students. And we're now left with nowhere or no place to record it. And that was quite a challenge. But I think if you're determined enough and, and creative enough, then you, you can find your ways to, um, to o- overcome that. You know, I was lucky enough to have some great players uh, say, <laughs> say they would record um, their, uh, for me. And I, I, find that, I found that quite a, a good creative challenge for, for the piece in, in specific. And you recorded the whole piece yourself, didn't you? Yeah, so my graduation piece, which was like the, the majority of the portfolio that I was handing in, you know, like for, for the end of my degree, was supposed to be performed tomorrow on the, the start of the new month. Um, obviously that's not going ahead so the day before our college like shut down forever I ran in and sort of made a makeshift recording studio in one of the practice rooms and recorded it all myself so there's this sort of nice sort of circular narrative going like the reason that I started composing was me performing myself and then I learned to write for other people but now that the thing that I've I've relied on to get me through the the final moments of my degree is just me at a piano <laughs> again, messing around and improvising. Just very different than you playing. Yeah, so <laughs> different. If I did that in the school hall now, they would tell me to leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we've been persevering, like to to make what was supposed to be a weekend of new music in a bunch of different venues around the Royal Welsh College is now all completely online through radio, and I think that uh, I've I've noticed a lot of people talking about radio where they weren't before because it's it's one way that people are connecting through music, Mm -hmm. especially I think over the radio and the live streams that you've been doing as well. And lots of other people have been sharing music in in this different way, like from their homes that you Mm -hmm. don't always sort of, you get to see a little bit behind the curtain. And for example, for this that we're doing now, it's like, it's an opportunity to share something that an audience doesn't get. If it's a very pristine concert hall, if it's, even if you're doing a concert that's quite informal, sometimes talking to an audience, you sort of, you know, you don't have to share everything. Mm. And I think that this situation now that we are all at home, it's sort of, it's it, to me, it feels much more relaxed. Yeah, and it, it breaks down the barrier of the concert hall in a way that certain people can see that it's a classical concert or it's a contemporary music concert, and therefore they won't go because it's got a kind of a preconceived notion of what it is but actually by breaking it down and putting it online it means it has a wider reach you know uh, a lovely thing I, I've got an, a, a, a number of nieces and nephews who I, I want to get to understand music and classical music more and you know having these live streams I've been sending it to my sisters saying you need to get you know, your children to listen to this because I want them to experience that because, you know, they're always worried about taking their children to a concert hall because they don't want the children to be like making noise and as the concert's going on because that's kind of like, oh, you shouldn't do that in a classical concert, which, you know, um, you shouldn't, no, I don't. Um, But but having it on online and in the radio, that's been really helpful for that side of things. It's like one big relaxed performance. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I, when you're doing the performance, it's not. <laughs> you know, I know, I know, I can imagine. More but difficult. I mean, I suppose it's just what you're used to. But you know, I'm I'm fine with doing a concert if I've got an audience there. But doing a concert when I've literally just got a phone and a yeah. microphone in front of me, and for a start, just having to trust that it's worked and there are people, you know, that it's it's going out um, live. But also just trying to feel like you've got some connection to your normal audience, but. I'm in my slippers in my living room. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's I mean, they were great in that that um, bullfighting video. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't the video. It was um. They, they are happy excellent your... slippers. Yes, <laughs> stomp your there. feet. Do you happy you know it's stuck? <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was a video. Awesome. Um, three quick from Primark. So we gave that product placement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be taken down now. You're going to have an email about that. Oh, no. <laughs> Take uh, this video down. Twice in one day. Um, no, it's it. It is difficult and it's 
it's actually, I'm finding it far more nerve wracking doing that. I actually even recording pre-recorded videos, mm -hmm. I'm far more nervous recording them than I would ever be doing a concert. It's bizarre. Mm. But I suppose it's, like it's, it's, some, it's what, you, what you're used to and learning a whole new skill set as you go along. A trick which we've learned in the recording side of things is that we will say to a musician when they're warming up that they're not being recorded whatever just play through it once but we'll put the recording on because they they just seem a lot more re relaxed and actually that first kind of playthrough minus a couple of bits obviously is probably the best take they're going to do because they just seem so settled and then as soon as you say okay we're recording now it just changes mm. how people are and I think that's the whole like idea. I know obviously you've had a lot more experience in the recording studio and that kind of whole side of things, but it, it, it changes your whole perception. And I mean, I remember back to my first unaccompanied recording and it was Biba Pasakalia was the first thing that I recorded yeah. on that first Bach disc. And I was so nervous because I'd never done that before. And mm. it was, you're so naked, you know, you, every tiny tiny sound on the violin when you're mm. recording unaccompanied every tiny noise that you make with your hands traveling along the fingerboard board even it's you can hear it and it's yeah. so it's not even just that you want to do a good job in that moment and you want it to be a performance but you also want it to be perfect mm. it's knowing that you know all of those things that normally the audience can't hear you're having to think about how to minimize all that as well and i only realized that as i was standing there in the in that first session yeah. that that was going to be an issue and i can remember we we spent ages on the opening and um, after i'd you know done a few runs and and we'd got the whole thing down but you know going back to clear up things that hadn't worked we spent hours on that opening and and matthew the producer was like yeah i think we've got it it's fine let's move on and we went through to the rest of the work did everything and at the end of the session, when I was beginning to feel relaxed and calm with everything, he said, now we've already got it, so it's, there's no pressure, but look, let's just do the opening again now that you're, you know, that you're really relaxed and, and just, just see what happens. And it was that just intelligence of, like you say, knowing, knowing how a musician is responding to what mm -hmm. they're doing and the psychology of it. And of course, going back to it at that point in the session was easy. What I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, comparatively to when when you have that that red lights come on and you're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, literally, and it's literally just sat there like on a, on a stand, like red light on. And we're recording. You're like, uh, no, yeah, I know what you mean. But talking, uh, uh, traveling on from the whole in, in uninspired thing. I think something I've noticed is is the whole thing that because composers are like nothing's changed mm. it then adds a little bit of pressure onto you because you you are then thinking well if, if nothing's changed I, I should just be carrying on as normal but it, it, it's not normal and and I hate people are like well you know you've got all the time in the world now to compose you can you, you should be able to compose loads but I have to be inspired to write music I have to you know that's just how I I am and being in the same four walls every day albeit being able to go for our hours exercise um it's just not inspiring and that that has been hard mm -hmm. that has been really hard um but we will get through it of course no I could totally agree with that um it's the same as you know people saying to performers I oh, know you've got all the time in the world to practice now um and you know even if you aren't homeschooling kids which I'm not you you find yourself in this position again and the only way that I can focus is by knowing that I've got a live stream to record mm -hmm. so I have to practice that music yeah. and it's got to be you know as good a quality as it would be for a concert or a recording in normal mm. life and if I didn't have those things to force me to kick me up the arse to do that work I would find it so hard in this situation when when you normally rely on deadlines or is it even, you're not even relying on them but you're so used to having have many concerts a week that you have to be prepared for you have to mm -hmm. you know make sure that you're fit and that all of those notes are 
going to come out right. And suddenly not to have that at all, it's, it's really, it's difficult. Mm, it is. Yeah, definitely. Like I say, we'll, we'll get around the other side of it. So last question. I, I spend <laughs> in normal life. I, I really enjoy following the two of you on Twitter because, you know, when I'm busy, just like, I either I'm at home practicing or I'm running somewhere to play a concert and I don't have as much life outside to do that as I would like. So it's always great to see you two, you know, heading off to whatever you're, you're off to next and, and seeing what's going on in the world. And it, mm. I, I kind of live slightly vicariously through it, but also <laughs> um, it's nice to see what's going on. So in an ideal world, once this is all over and, I guess life is back to normal. What are the things that you're going to be looking forward to doing, visiting, going to see here? Well, one thing that I've noticed, I've, I've been having lots of dreams about going to lots of different places. Um, I, I spoke about it earlier, but I was living in Zurich a couple for a couple of months last year. And I've had so many dreams about just going back there and it's something that you can't plan for at the moment, but I really want to go back to Zurich and go to other places around Europe as well, just to see them. But knowing that I can't, I think is the reason why I desperately want to go. Mm. And I think the other thing as well is I, I keep saying it and I keep thinking it, just I just so desperately want to see an orchestra play, hear some chamber music, go to a concert and feel that sort of buzz of electricity mm. that you yeah. get when you have live music or or live theatre, anything like that. I'm just so looking forward to, and it's something that I think is so easy to take for granted and not realise like how amazing that, yeah. that sort of thing is. Yeah. I'm going to be the boring one and say that we had a holiday booked. <laughs> and It was our first holiday in about three years because every other time we go away, I'm either travelling for mm. playing or you're in Zurich. And <laughs> um, so I was looking forward just to have a rest, which is really weird considering like now we're in this situation where you're like, well, you've, you've got a lot of time, but I just, <laughs> it's not the same. But no, I, I completely agree also quite literally that I didn't think I would miss hearing a live orchestra or live music as much as I am, you know, there's nothing which can compare to that um it's like it, it's like the electricity like you say it's like in that moment and the feeling you are and all of that you just can't create through through listening to headphones and there's been this argument recently i've noticed about our live streams and people taking their their music home is it is it detrimental to to concerts in the future and I don't think so at all I I, I don't because it, for now it's giving us comfort through this this quite scary time and it me makes us even more excited for when we come out of that to actually hear that and experience that live so yeah I think that is what I'm looking forward to you know more than ever is is going to watch live music and live opera and just being around other people and hearing uh, I love that when we're at a concert yes thank god um no but I love I love that when we're at concerts and you're hearing people talking about that the, the new piece like oh I didn't expect like you said I didn't expect to like that new piece or oh isn't this production lovely or isn't this production rubbish or like <laughs> you know all of those conversations which which you can't have no um so last question what's your favorite gin I'm a, a little bit biased because the Bombay Sapphire Distillery is just around the corner from my house. So it has to be Bombay Sapphire. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, I, I I do like Bombay Sapphire, but I did try that Brecon gin. Mm. That was very nice. Yeah. I'm a bit torn, but I'm going to have to say Bombay too, mm -hmm. just because he buys it. And that's kind of all I get given. <laughs> 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 What's your favourite gin? Oh, um, so I've got, I guess, two particularly favourite ones. Um, one is Harris, Isle of Harris Gin, partly because mm. it's very, very tasty and partly because it has the most beautiful bottle. And the other one is Kirkovard Gin, which is from Orkney. 
I, I like my islands. Um, but yeah, cocoa bar is absolutely amazing. It's so tasty. Um, and yeah, when I'm when I'm lucky enough to do some Magnus Festival, I'll go up and buy myself a bottle to take home, and then um, have problems getting my luggage through home. <laughs> too heavy um i spent a long time repacking last time i was coming back <laughs> thank you so so much for joining me for this both of you no, thank you and thank you for anybody who's who's watching it and this is the first of um a series of little videos with maybe not so little videos um with people in the music industry and um so thank you both of you jesper and, and derry and and yeah, do tune in for more of these in the future.